I'm Alan Wardus, and you're listening to Think Radio. It was really in a small shed in a dusty field in the middle of nowhere uh, with 30 employees. But by the time I ended, uh, we had over a thousand. I was the biggest employer in the country, the largest earner of foreign exchange, and we were selling our products in 35 different countries, including the United States. Think Radio is supported by the Gunnison Country Times, Gunnison's locally owned hometown newspaper, and by listeners like you. To find out how you can become a Think Radio supporter, visit kbut.org. My guest today is Dr. Paul Holden. He holds a PhD in economics from Duke University, and he specializes in law and economics, international trade, international relations, economic development, and private sector development. In his youth, Dr. Holden was employed by the International Monetary Fund for 10 years and by the World Bank for six years. In his career, he's worked in over 50 countries, advising governments, companies, and nonprofits alike. He's a widely published author and currently is the president of the Enterprise Research Institute. Paul, thanks for joining me. Thank you, Alan. It's a pleasure to be here. I think I should also add that I'm honorary professor of economics at Western. That is Western Colorado University. That's correct. And in addition, I spent 10 years of my life in a small African country where I started a business manufacturing surfing clothing. Um, <laughs> surfing clothing. Surfing clothing. So t-shirts, uh, you know, shorts. surf shorts, etc. Yes. Um, it was interesting because the country was Lesotho, which is landlocked. And uh, 95% of my employees had never seen the sea. Um, (laughs) One lunchtime, we put up this giant screen and played a surfing movie. It was almost a riot. (laughs) They were totally amazed. And now suddenly wanted a company field trip. Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I have to question the wisdom of starting a surfing business in a landlocked African nation. I mean, where was your marketplace? Well, it started uh, almost by accident. Um, It was really in a small shed in a dusty field in the middle of nowhere uh, with 30 employees. But by the time I ended, uh, we had over a 1,000. I was the biggest employer in the country, the largest earner of foreign exchange, and we were selling our products in 35 different countries, including <laughs> the United States. I have to ask, are you a surfer? I'm not a surfer. <laughs> it would have surprised me had you said yes. Well, so there has to be a story there. Why surfing clothing? At the time, I, was, I had taken a sabbatical from the International Monetary Fund to kind of sort out my life because I realized that um, if I didn't leave, I would be locked in with golden handcuffs. The the benefits are huge Mm -hmm. and the pension Mm -hmm. is enormous. And yet I was really quite unhappy. So I took a sabbatical um, to think about things at a university in South Africa. And um, this kind of dropped out of nowhere, really. Um, I dropped out of nowhere into nowhere. (laughs) That's well put, that is. Um, So I was approached and got some money and started it, and it just took off. Does the company still exist? It does not. Um, I, uh, at the time, had not realized quite all the perils of um, bringing one's family into one's business. And um, in the end, it was its downfall for me. I left Mm -hmm. well before the final reckoning, but eventually it closed. And you've been with the Enterprise Research Institute for 20 years now. Is that when you took that work on? When, when no. Um, I came back from Southern Africa to the United States to work for the World Bank, uh, which I did for uh, six years. Uh, but I'm really not a large organization person. I like to do what I want to do, if you know what I mean. That might explain why you're living in a tiny town <laughs> in the middle of the Colorado Rockies. Exactly. Um, And, I mean, another bizarre feature of how things evolved is that I was approached by a Swiss billionaire to start a research institute in Portugal. Oh, it happens every day to everyone. Oh, absolutely. And it it seemed perfect because when I had been at the IMF, I had worked in Portugal. And um, I even knew the building that he had thought he'd bought. But um, as often happens, uh, life 
uh, through a spanner in the works. It turned out that the building had been sold to two other people besides the Swiss billionaire. <laughs> <laughs> so one day he called me and said, I've got good news and bad news. Um, the good news is that if you want to start a research institute, I'll fund it for three years. But the bad news is the sale isn't going through. So you have to do it all yourself. Ah, I see. And that's how the Enterprise Research Institute started. And what does your work there consist of? Well, it's it, again, it, it's something that has evolved, Alan. Initially, it was doing pure research, um, mainly on the economics of small business issues in Latin America, which was the particular interest of the Swiss billionaire. Uh -huh. um, but at a certain point, he wanted me to write a book and put his name on it, and I simply couldn't do that. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> I just couldn't do it. I'm not, I can't exactly explain why. But Ghostwriter just isn't in your resume. It's not in my resume. And um, so I said, look, I can't do it. I can't take your money anymore. And he was very good about it. He said, well, I'll fund you for another six months while you evolve into something else. And it evolved from pure research into a consulting company. And um, at one point, I was one of those K Street bandits in Washington, D.C., with an office um, on Connecticut Avenue and, um, you know, a large staff and so on, doing work, contract work on economic development issues. But, you know, there's an essential um, pact with the devil in, in doing this sort of work. And so I found myself doing stuff that I didn't really want to do simply to pay the bills and... Um, a time arrived when a number of people working for me were wanted to go to graduate school. Uh, my second in command um, had got married and was going to have a baby, and it became an opportune time to downsize, which is what I did. So I left Connecticut Avenue and moved uptown and um, became much smaller and really have managed to work almost exclusively on things that really interest me, which has been wonderful. And what is that? What does interest you in this work? Well, um, my experience in Lesotho making surf shorts got me interested in um, what makes investment work in small countries. And it also gave me another insight, which was how much damage I'd been doing when I had been working at the IMF, um, <laughs> which was kind of interesting uh, because I think their model is an incorrect one. Um, well, of course, you're not the first one to say that, but I do want to hear why you say that. Well, um, to, to say it, I need to get a little technical. The IMF is called in by countries when they get into balance of payments problems. In other words, the inflow of foreign exchange is far smaller than the, the outflows of foreign exchange. They're running mm -hmm. a balance of payments deficit. Right. And um, the prescription of the IMF, even now, dates back from some work done in the 1960s by a Nobel Prize winning economist called Robert Mundell. And it involves two things. One is that domestic spending must really contract. And the second is that uh, resources um, and investment must switch from existing activities to those that involve exporting. And they do this in two ways. One by drastically restricting government spending and credit in the economy and changing the exchange rate. Now, the principle behind this is that investors will say, well, the exchange rate's changed, and therefore these exporting activities are now profitable, and we must do that. But they omit a vital step, which is how do you get those investments to happen? And in so many countries around the world, which are poorer countries, the restrictions on investment, the red tape, the corruption, and so on, uh, is such that it makes it very difficult for that change to happen. And mm. as a result, um, much of the IMF's prescription involves simply contracting the economy. Mm -hmm. And this is where the criticism comes from, especially uh, from people who don't understand the next step uh, necessary in order to stimulate uh, So we get stuck in step activity. one, cutting domestic spending, yeah, that, which is things like um, well, that's things programs. Like government spending, yeah. uh, government investment in infrastructure, uh, social programs, 
and so on. Which guarantees political unrest. Which guarantees it, especially because many of these countries are food importers, and when the exchange rate goes down, food becomes more expensive. So poorer people have a double whammy, and this is one of the reasons why the IMF is so unpopular around the world. Mm -hmm. And they don't take the necessary next step, which is to say you have to change the barriers to investment and and undertaking new activities. And it's not surprising because I started off as a macroeconomist. Um, my PhD was on international reserve demand. Um, and I knew nothing about this. And it was really only my experience in, um, in Africa that made me start to think about all of these other issues. Mm -hmm. Well, so that brings us to a great segue because I'm interested in the Western United States. I'm interested in how economics works here. And one of the reasons why I wanted to reach out to you for this conversation is having run across the perspective that in many ways, when we say things like the developed world and the developing world, that's too broad of a stroke, that there are actually similarities from when you get down to a more granular level, there are similarities between communities, even in the United States and what people are facing elsewhere. Yes. And so you've You've raised the issue of barriers to investment and barriers to development. In what ways do you see that happening right here at home? As you say, it's a, it, we're looking at a very granular issue, right? And there are analogies to a number of the countries um, in which I've worked over the last, say, 10 years of my life, which are small Pacific Island countries, and the similarities and the challenges that, say, smaller towns and communities in the western United States face are those that the small Pacific Islands face. And one is small, mm, mm -hmm. right? Now, we have a lot of evidence that there are what economists call agglomeration economies, which means that in large urban areas, uh, there are a lot of people with talent, and there are a lot of similar people with talent, so that there are um, synergies between people with similar training, with similar goals. And in addition, there is a far wider range of talent available in large urban areas. So that small communities, whether they be in the Pacific or whether they be in the Western United States, mm -hmm. face the same challenges. And, uh, and this is really a critical issue. And it's one that we face, for example, in Colorado, which Firstly, the perception of Coloradans as being in love with the outdoors and, and in hiking and skiing and so on, uh, it's one of the most urbanized states in the United States. You're right. That is a very surprising statement. Um, and, and what are the metrics you're using to... Well, if you take Colorado Springs, Denver, Boulder, Fort Collins, nearly 80% of the state's population live in that urban agglomeration. Uh, yeah. Now... What are the characteristics of urban agglomerations? Well, wages are higher. There's more entertainment. There's more variety. The internet is better. Transportation mm -hmm. links are mm -hmm. better, and so on. So from that perspective, these things have a very positive impact on, on productivity. Now, in the long run, our prosperity absolutely depends on productivity. Now, the premise that you would read about, say, 15 years ago, which is anyone can live and work anywhere they want, has turned out not to be true. And some companies like Yahoo, for example, um, have brought all of their workers back away from remote locations into their headquarters. You describe this trend, and yet, at the same time, all over the Mountain West in particular, and I suspect small communities everywhere else, economic development is the number one issue on everyone's mind. Well, it is. And they're proceeding on the premise that it's possible. Well, I, th I think it is possible. But just think about the Gunnison Valley. The Gunnison Valley has got the town of Mount Crested Butte. It's got the town of Crested Butte, the city of Gunnison, and the county. These are four um, large bodies of government. On top of that, it's got the Gunnison Regional Housing Authority. It's got the Regional Transport Authority. It's got um, 
the tourism authority, uh, and so on. And these are all separate entities, and they all have their own overhead, which is spread very thinly among a population which is may not yet be 17,000 people, mm -hmm. which is incredibly inefficient because the overhead that is imposed upon the citizens of the county is really very high. Well, and does this landscape also represent the kind of barrier to investment? Well, to, to some degree. Um, and look, the fact is that per capita incomes in the Mountain West are much lower than they are in the urban um, centers of, mm -hmm. of the Front Range. Even if you're lucky enough to be doing the same kind of work. Even if you're lucky enough. So it's very hard to earn a significant amount of money uh, that is generated by working within communities in the Mountain West. It turns out that the highest salaries, by far, um, are paid by government, which is kind of an interesting issue. If you think you're competing, you know, for highly trained people and government's paying the best, where do you think the better people are going to go? And yet, you're an economist in parts of the world where barriers are more extreme than these that you describe here. Surely uh, you can see some way forward. Undoubtedly, the Mountain West has huge advantages over these small Pacific Island countries. You know, Denver from Gunnison is three and a half hours <laughs> by road. Sydney from Samoa uh, is a six-hour plane ride, uh, and it's expensive. And Sydney is a long way from anywhere as well. Mm. Um, so, <laughs> so there's so, that. So, so there is that. So, you know, we have hope. I'm Alan Wardus, and you're listening to Think Radio. My guest today is economist Paul Holden. One of the reasons we chose Gunnison County was this uh, well, a wonderful area in which to live, a ski mountain, a, um, there's an airport, there's a hospital, and very importantly, there's a university, which makes it I think unique. There are very few other communities that have these advantages. And mm -hmm. yet, I think at the same time, um, there is very, very much more that we could do. Well, let's go there then, because there are communities around the, the Western United States that don't have many of those advantages you just listed. Let's proceed from the premise that prosperity is possible, even in those places. What's your advice? You're sitting down with the decision makers. What directions do you tell them to move in? Well, I only tell them indirectly because they often don't ask me. <laughs> Let's assume that you've got that contract. <laughs> that that contract I've, I've often made myself unpopular by criticizing some of the initiatives. Uh, mm -hmm. So thinking outside the Gunnison Valley... What are your chief objections to the way things typically have been done? Well, um, one is fragmentation, that all the elements of the community are not getting together. It's often disproportionately dominated by a few powerful economic interests. And that, by that, I would also include government, things like school districts and regional hospitals and, in addition, business interests, farming uh, interests. Um, they all have their own objectives and quite often they're not consistent and the job of a local government should be to try and find common ground that everybody can agree on. To get back to the Gunnison Valley, uh, one of my issues has been that we spend a huge amount of money subsidizing flights in for the ski season when the skiing is not a growth industry and uh, could we use that money uh, in a better way. To my mind, the future of prosperity in this valley rests on effectively leveraging 
the university as an economic driver. And I will explain why. Uh, because the other two important economic activities are tourism and construction. Now, a problem with both, both those industries, uh, and I did a study on this back in the 2000s, um, is that they're highly pro-cyclical. And what do I mean by that? Well, I mean that they rest on the prosperity of the national economy. When the national economy is booming, tourism booms and construction booms. But when the national economy tanks, as it did in, say, 2008, 2009, uh, those industries disproportionately suffer. And so mm-hmm. we're promoting uh, an over-reliance on those two activities, particularly tourism. And the other um, factor behind both these industries is that productivity in them is relatively low. And that's why wages tend to be relatively low, that you have a lot of people working in them. Uh, right. The productivity drag. is uh, – growth comes from three sources – an increase in the labor force, uh, an increase in the capital stock, or an increase in productivity. And that's what our prosperity depends on. China, for example, has been devoting something like 50% of its total output to investment. Now, compare that with, say, the United States, where it's just over 20, and you see the impact that has on its growth statistics. But there's something that a lot of people fail to take into account, which is that if investment is that high, consumption is that much lower. So although their output's been growing very rapidly, their consumption hasn't been growing at the same rate. (laughs) So (laughs) economics is really kind of a game of whack-a-mole, is what you're saying. You you, you get one thing under control and... (laughs) That's one way of looking at it, Alan. (laughs) (laughs) But it must give you a headache. It's one of the things that people fail to take into account when they look at the United States in a relative way is that consumption in the United States is far higher than it is really anywhere else in the world, and, you know, anywhere of any size in the world. And since, you know, we think, and I know all of the arguments about, you know, materialism, blah, Mm -hmm. blah, blah. That's a bad thing. It's a terrible thing, but people actually like to consume things. And um, (laughs) turns out. (laughs) (laughs) It turns out, exactly. Uh, As a result, um, the the United States, the prosperity in the United States is often overlooked. But let let me just carry on a little bit uh, regarding, you know, the local economy and what communities in the Western United States can do. I mean, one of the things that is a huge issue, as you know here, is affordable housing. And one of my frustrations is that no one has done a serious analysis of why housing is relatively expensive. So when prices rise, what you want is a supply response. Uh, Because prices are going up, investors say, oh, we can make some money, Mm -hmm. Uh, let's invest. This is not a role, in my view, for government because the history of government housing is dismal, to say the least. And yet we're not getting, as far as I can perceive, the supply response we would like. Which brings us right straight back to the question of barriers to investment. Exactly. But... No, being a little too specific in terms of um, the, my answer to the question that you <laughs> posed, which was, if you're a small town or a small community in the Mountain West, is there anything you can do uh, to increase prosperity? Well, um, look, it's an exact um, mirror image of the issues that face small Pacific Island countries, and that is that the young people, the productive young people, are all going off to Australia and New Zealand. There's an interesting factoid. In fact, it was something that came up while I was doing some work in Jamaica. I was doing some work on on how to promote investment and private sector development and so on and so forth. And the Minister of Finance said to me, uh, well, where are all Jamaican entrepreneurs? And I said... (laughs) In New York City. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Exactly my response. And one of the amazing things is that a Jamaican can get on a plane in Kingston, fly to New York City and earn five times as much as they do in Jamaica. Now, it's the same person. Why is it that the same person uh, can earn five times as much in New York City? And is the answer the one you've already given us? Uh, It's economies of scale, it's um, regulation, uh, it's government interference, it's inefficiencies arising from local and regional governments, it's uh, quite often taxation, uh, where... It's uh, someone starts a formal business and they become 
one, a focus for being taxed, two, a focus for regulation, and so on. And these mm -hmm. are pretty extreme. Mm -hmm. And um, as a result, they say, to hell with it, I'll just stay under the radar and be informal. But it's very hard to be productive. So what they do, the entrepreneurial ones, is move to, is move to the United States as, mm -hmm. as much as they can. So do you find that this uh, picture you're painting has its analog in the Mountain West then, these mountain island towns like ours? Yes. That people because, are leaving because of some of these same Because, issues. yes, they can earn a lot more in Denver, right, for example. Now, um, of course, it's not a one-to-one -one comparison because the cost of living in Denver is, uh, is much higher. Mm -hmm. um, so it really, I mean, it's a huge problem, um, the out-migration of people. But to some degree, uh, it's being offset by the costs of agglomeration, the sitting in traffic, traffic in Denver is appalling, and it's appalling there. All, the way, <laughs> all the way along the Front Range, mm -hmm. and, it's, and, and there's air pollution. So people begin to say, is there another way? And I think the job of local government is to facilitate the other way. Well, and one of the things that has risen to the top of the conversation here about economic development, one of the assets that we do have is genuine community. Entrepreneurs who have moved here from um, Denver or elsewhere say it's much more difficult to get uh, something off the ground in a place where there are thousands just like you doing the same thing. It's much easier to leverage human resources when you're in a place where your kids are playing soccer together. Oh, look, I do agree with that. And in fact, the whole sense of community here uh, is one of the huge attractions. Um, you know, we could phone you and Issa up on Saturday and say, come to dinner tomorrow. <laughs> uh, if you try and do that in Washington, they'll say, well, now, let me think. My next free evening is two months from now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And clearly, I don't have a life at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, the pressures of living in urban environments are much, much higher. Um, I think that one of the goals of every community should be to facilitate, to, to kind of look at the local economy and say, what can work here? And then facilitate that happening. And I don't mean facilitate by giving tax breaks or, you know, special advantages or whatever, uh, but making them welcome, making them aware of all of the assets of a community. At the very least, what small communities across the American West can cling to is that economic development is not an either-or proposition. It's not either you're in a city and succeed or you're in a rural area and you have, pardon the pun, a, a big mountain to climb. It can be done here. Yes. I would also state that the term economic development is not a dirty phrase, that it's absolutely essential and there are all sorts of benefits mm -hmm. from economic development, including a better environment, including a better way of life, a more intellectually stimulating life. Fewer people living below the poverty line. Exactly. Paul, thanks for joining me today. My great pleasure, Alan. Think Radio is a production of Alan Wardus Media. To contact Alan, visit alanwardusmedia.com. The show's producer is Issa Forrest. Original music by Issa Forrest. Thanks for listening. Join us next week for another great conversation on Think Radio.